This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. You know, we move on. Uh, one of the great things about working at UCSF is that uh, we're surrounded by people who push the envelope and try things that have never been done before. So I'm a great admirer of Peter Stock's work, the pioneer work on HIV and, uh, and liver transplant. Can we do better? That's the talk. Okay. Peter. Uh, thank you, Francis. I, somebody left their cell phone up here, Dr. Hiroshi. I, I, I don't know if Neil's out there still, but Neil, I, I, there's one thing when you, I've, I've had a debate Rio many times, and when he starts the debate with, I love you, um, that is the kiss of death. Um, um, <clears throat> he's, he's totally oblivious to what I'm saying. Um, anyway, um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, our results with the uh, HIV uh, positive transplant recipients. Last time I spoke with this group, I think it was either two or three years ago, uh, but it definitely is time to talk about it again for a couple of reasons. One of them um, you may have heard about yesterday, um, the HOPE Act just uh, passed uh, Congress um, with it was unanimous bipartisan support, the bill, uh, the laws noted as being changed to allow um, the use of HIV positive organs and HIV positive recipients. And I think um, what so, we, we can talk about that another time, um, the, the merits of that, but I think anything um, that increases the donor population um, is something that uh, should be aggressively pursued and multiple reasons for it. Um, what I'm gonna talk very briefly about today is um, the results of our uh, NIH trial that included over uh, ultimately 20 centers across the U.S. And we uh, included 275 transplant recipients, 125 liver transplant patients, 150 kidney transplant patients. I want to point out that at the end of the study, it closed about a year and a half ago, we had over 300 people um, on the waiting list uh, for either kidney or liver transplants, and that was just scratching the surface. Uh, so there's a, there's a huge need out there. Um, and this is coming at a time uh, where I know many of you uh, have, have contacted us on multiple occasions, should we still refer these patients based on our outcomes? And, and that's really what we're going to focus on today. Um, our selection criteria, um, patients had to have a CD4 count greater than 200 for kidney transplantation. For liver transplant patients, we drop it down to 100 because these patients have huge spleen splenic sequestration and um, we don't think the peripheral CD4 count really adequately reflects um, uh, their um, immune competence. Uh, patients had to have an undetectable HIV viral load at the time of uh, uh, transplant, if they were a kidney transplant patient for liver patients, uh, many who had toxicity from the drugs who couldn't tolerate them, we would say they could have a detectable viral load as long as we could suppress them. We worked with our um, HIV providers to determine that. And finally, um, uh, we excluded patients only with opportunistic infections that we couldn't treat. So patients with visceral KS, and I actually think that's no longer a contraindication, but PML and chronic cryptosporidiosis still is a, uh, a contraindication. For this trial, uh, because we wanted to capture all potential candidates, we allowed um, the patients to be on any antiretroviral regimen and we just figured out how to work with it. Um, that's one of the things that I'm gonna talk about. We don't wanna do that anymore. Um, for um, prophylaxis, uh, these patients receive the same prophylaxis that all our transplant recipients receive with the caveat that if they are um, uh, if, if their CD4 counts drop below uh, 75, then we prophylax for MAC, which is something we don't do in our regular transplant recipients. We allowed all immunosuppressive regimens. We discouraged the use of thymoglobulin and, in fact, prohibited it in the liver transplant patients because we used it one time and the patient died of sepsis within the first week of transplant. 
um, and rejection was managed just how you always see it managed. I'm not gonna talk about the kidney transplant res uh, results at all, but suffice it to say um, that uh, the results uh, were comparable to the HIV negative population. But what was so surprising is we saw a two to three-fold higher incidence of rejection. So when we went into this, we thought, uh, their immune competency isn't so great, they probably won't need any immunosuppression. What we found was just the opposite. Um, it's a very potent immune response. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about our liver transplant recipients and really focus on uh, HCV co-infection because that's where the question is. About 30% of patients with HIV are co-infected with hepatitis C because of uh, shared risk factors. 10% are, um, uh, were co uh, are co uh, patients are co-infected with hepatitis B, and progression to cirrhosis is quite rapid in these recipients. In our cohort, 71% um, were co-infected with C and 22% with B, and 36% um, had a cancer. Um, <clears throat> When you look at all the things that affect the liver, and I've talked about this before, it is absolutely amazing that we get away with it. Uh, not only do you have the toxicities of the virus, um, you have uh, further damage based on immune reconstitution, you have opportunistic infections that uh, co-infect the liver, you have direct toxicity from, from alcohol, uh, HCV treatment adds on to it, and then that's before we even talk about the toxicity, the mitochondrial toxicity of the antiretroviral agents. The protease inhibitors um, cause diabetes. Prograf, cyclosporin cause diabetes. Um, so we're pushing a lot of these patients uh, into diabetes. Uh, results in dyslipidemia, fatty liver disease, <laughs> and you can only imagine um, the problems. So despite that, I want you to look at these results for the HPV co-infected patients. If you go out five years, look at the survival rate. It is comparable, not statistically significant, not significantly different than the mono-infected patients. This is the proof that HIV is not the issue. The issue is the co-infection. Uh, in the HBV group, we didn't see any prolonged recurrence of hepatitis uh, B antigen. H however, 53% of the patients had a detectable HBV level sometime post-transplant, and it was much more frequent in, in patients with detectable HBV DNA prior to transplant and patients who were treated for rejection. So the long-term management with hepatitis B immunoglobulin is necessary, and I think this is sort of the um, uh, the sort of data that supports that. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the bad news because it really it was the only bad news we had in the trial and that was our transplantation of um, the patients co-infected with hepatitis C. We know from uh, prior studies that patients that are co-infected with C have higher rates of weightless mortality. Many, many other centers now in Europe have shown worse post-liver transplant survival, more severe recurrence of HCV disease, and a poor response to HCV treatment. Um, <clears throat> Nora uh, studied this in 235 temporally matched controls uh, that were mono-infected. Um, and we had 89 patients in the trial that were co-infected with hepatitis C. And when we look at patient survival going out three years, you can see about a 20% decrease in survival in the uh, co-infected group, 60% at three years, and 53% graft survival at three years. So when we see 50%, it raises everybody's antenna because now we're talking about transplanting a group of patients that, um, uh, and utilizing a scarce resource. And five-year survivals of 50% are usually, uh, usually becomes an exclusion criteria. Not only that, um, uh, John, uh, I don't know if John is uh, here right now, but uh, Dr. Roberts was quite concerned about 
the impact of this, because uh, we it wasn't an insignificant number within our own group. Um, and uh, we were worried about our, um, our center-specific results that are published to the SRTR because we didn't want to lose our status as being above expected. And this is a huge problem across the country because we can, we can take a little bit of a hit, um, but other smaller centers cannot. And one by one, centers are dropping out. There's about five, five centers in the country now that are transplanting patients co-infected with hepatitis C. And this is at the very time that we're um, uh, just beginning to succeed um, in a dramatic way. And uh, it's, I actually think maybe Nora would have been better if you would have spoken before me um, uh, because uh, this is totally going to make most of what I'm saying, I hope it's going to make most of what I'm saying irrelevant. So if we looked at the whole group and looked for predictors of graft survival, um, HIV infection was a risk, and treated acute rejection was a risk for graft survival. If we just looked within the co-infected group, trying to find out which patients um, we could pick out so that at least we could continue to do transplants in a handful of the patients, it turns out that if patients had a BMI less than 21 at the time of enrollment, they did poorly. If they needed a kidney transplant, they did poorly. If we used an, an, a, a donor that was hepatitis C positive, they did poorly, which is in uh, contra, contradiction to what we see in our mono-infected patients. And, and finally, donor age, which is not surprising, um, strongly predicted the outcome. So if we get rid of all those high-risk groups, so we don't transplant anyone who, had a, um, uh, who needed a kidney transplant, didn't use HCV-positive donors, um, did not transplant patients that were wasted at the time of evaluation, um, and limited our donors to age less than 50, um, our results, that yellow line represented those patients, and really we could make our results pretty comparable, and that's what we did, and that's how we finished the trial. Um, so just by doing better patient and donor selection, you can improve the results. Now, in terms of uh, the findings by our European colleagues, um, they found a very high incidence of severe recurrence of hepatitis C in their co-infected patients that we did not see. But if we looked for predictors of severe HCV recurrence, patients that were treated for acute rejection, once again, were those patients that did poorly. Uh, in, in fact, HIV infection did not come out as a predictor in the multivariate analysis of severe recurrent disease. But once again, in our liver patients, the incidence of acute rejection was twofold higher. Not the absence of the immune system, it's the presence of a very dysregulated system. And treated acute rejection was an independent predictor of, of graft loss overall, of graft loss in the co-infected patients, and of severe HCV recurrence. And the only other thing I wanted to point out about these rejection episodes is 50% of them happened within 20 days of transplant. So many people are arguing that our immunosuppression might not be adequate. Um, I think that may be true, and I'll get to that in just a second. But one thing that is, is crystal clear is these patients are primed um, to reject. They have a pumped up immune system, um, and there might be some cross-reactivity between the alloantigen and all the copathogens uh, that they're exposed to. Um, our lab is trying to get to the bottom of that. But the European group has found both in the kidney and the liver patients that they can knock down that rate of rejection by putting the patients on integrase-based antiretroviral therapy. Um, Raltegravir is, is the, um, was only used in two of our patients in the trial, um, but since they went strictly to that in Europe, um, they've completely eliminated the risk of rejection. It's the same as in their control HIV negative population. And the reason for that is the protease inhibitors that were commonplace for um, uh, um, the HIV positive patients um, inhibit the cytochrome P450 system, and patients end up getting like one milligram of tacrolimus a week. Um, so the levels are all over the place. The drug exposure is inadequate. And just by giving them exposure to adequate immunosuppression, 
the, Im the immunosuppression, um, uh, I mean, sorry, the rejection rates are back to normal. So moving forward, um, if you are referring a patient um, that is co-infected, make sure it doesn't matter for any sort of, uh, uh, for, for liver or kidney transplantation, B, C, doesn't matter. Uh, get them on an integrase-based regimen that avoids the protease inhibitors, and uh, the results are going to be much better. Uh, in terms of opportunistic infections, um, we saw a handful, but nothing uh, worse than in our HIV-negative patients. I would comment on the Kaposi sarcoma. We had four cutaneous Kaposi sarcoma. But um, it turns out that um, you may have seen the New England Journal of Medicine article where uh, rapamycin, or one of our immunosuppressants, is it downregulates VEGF, and it is the treatment for Kaposi sarcoma. Um, we put all four patients on uh, rapamycin-based immunosuppression and just watched the lesions melt away. So I'm taking that off the list of uh, things that are problematic in terms of um, contraindications to transplantation. The human papillomavirus, which is the etiologic agent of both cervical and anorectal disease, is, uh, is going to be a problem. Uh, we have noticed progression uh, using cervical and anal paps of disease in many of the patients, and have now picked up our second uh, anal cancer in situ, um, and uh, if you pick them up on time, they can be treated. So the, just one last thing. This, this, whole trial has been filled with unexpected findings. And I think one of the most interesting ones, uh, Steve Deeks is one of our um, colleagues um, based at San Francisco General, uh, one of our HIV um, uh, scientists and physicians, um, who uh, um, has an interest in the HIV viral reservoir. And it turns out that not only did we not see progression of HIV in any of the patients, uh, he's been studying the reservoir based on uh, the on CD4 persist, uh, HIV persistence in the CD4 positive lymphocytes, and we we found this very surprising finding that patients on serolimus, and it was only 10% of the patients in our trial were on serolimus-based therapy for any number of reasons. The viral reservoir uh, pretty much uh, was wiped out. So this looks like. <laughs> I mean, if you just looked at this, you'd say, oh my God, you got a cure f for HIV. Um, and it, it turns out that there is a huge interest now in the HIV world. Um, they're jumping on this data um, because most of the money in HIV research is going toward the cure. They're done with uh, uh, multiple therapy. And tor, in, tor inhibition, serolimus, is in, 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 the, um, in, in the pipeline of things that they want to uh, look at, and we're going we're to look at it for sure. We'll be converting some of our patients to uh, serolimus-based therapy or everolimus-based therapy and see what happens to the, to the, um, to the uh, reservoir. So in summary, um, as of today, we can make it better. We can make it better by better management of acute rejection. Patients should be switched to integrase-based regimens and get them off of the protease inhibitors. Uh, <clears throat> utilizing a limited number of recipient and donor selection criteria uh, really makes things a lot better. So no combined liver kidney patients. As of now, that's going to change as soon as Nora gives her talk. Uh, no patients uh, with BMIs less than 20 and no HCV positive donors. And um, what is clear is we have to figure out how to eradic eradicate hepatitis C. Um, we have two patients um, that are, you know, I, I hope Nora talks about them because I, um, I have never, I have been so impressed with this sabosfavir. Uh, patients that failed everything and had ascites, and we thought they were going to be dead. Our co-infected patients, um, they have cleared their virus, putting, put them on sabosfavir monotherapy. So um, I have to say that um, uh, it, everything I've said is going to change. Um, so keep referring your patients. I think um, uh, 
I think the criteria for not, no combined liver kidney transplants will go away if we can eradicate the hepatitis C. So there are a huge number of people that I, I, I should acknowledge, but I'm, suffice it to say that all my surgical colleagues have done these transplants. Um, uh, our hepatologists have been uh, hugely supportive. I have to say um, I'm impressed with Nora's tenacity in, uh, and her aggressiveness in terms of uh, treating these patients. Uh, she's relentless, keeps going, and um, it has paid off. Um, and also, um, Lori Carlson, Lori is right over there. Lori ran the national trial, and we fired her about, I don't know, th six months ago, and now she has taken over. She's our new, uh, new head of, our new, in charge of our liver transplant service. So, uh, Lori, you, you might want to wave there so people recognize you. She took Cindy Galbraith's place, so um, uh, thank you very much, and um, thank you. Thank you very much, a wonderful talk. Questions? Um, so, uh, uh, in terms of um, other patients with uh, non-hepatitis C, are you seeing any difference in terms of etiology of liver disease and the outcome for non-hepatitis C? So, um, we haven't seen an increase. I, I, I think um, the vast majority of our patients are still hepatitis B and hepatitis C and a couple of alcohol, but not, no, no um, lesions um, and no fulminant failure related to the antiretroviral agents. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks very much, Peter.